Um, <coughs> so the aims of this is to highlight the primary findings, to give you the common causes of airway obstruction that we found in our cases, and tell you about some of the less common causes. Uh, talk to you about extubation planning and staff training and equipment. So our primary findings were we had 38 out of the 133 reports in the anaesthesia group. That comes to 28%. And we found in all the cases the reporters gave airway obstruction as the primary cause rather than regurgitation, aspiration, hyperventilation, etc. <coughs> Two died in this group and one sustained brain damage. The remaining patients were admitted to ICU, um, one for up to 30 days, and this constitutes moderate harm, as we've discussed before. Eight emergency surgical areas were attempted, uh, 10 were attempted, and eight were successful. So here, this is a post anaesthetic care unit, typical to those up and down the country who were submitting cases. Two thirds of our cases were consultant cases, 75% elective and scheduled, and, and occurring during the day. Um, in half of the cases, we actually predicted that it, the area would be difficult, and sadly, in, a ha in another half, there was delay in recognising the problem in recovery. We saw profound hypoxia in 17 cases, and five required CPR because of uh, the hypoxia. So these are serious, serious problems. Overall, the panel judged that area management was good in eight, poor in 10, and mixed in 18. So onto the common causes that we found, well, a large percentage were caused by tracheal tube problems, 24 patients, and supraglottic area devices in eight. And we saw laryngospasm in both of these groups as well as on its own. <coughs> 20 cases occurred in the operating room and 16 in recovery. And we saw upper airway obstruction causing post-obstructive pulmonary edema in a, in a third of these cases, rather large number. And obesity, asthma, and chronic obstructive disease were with pulmonary disease were the most common comorbidities. So this uh, problem in 13 patients, they weren't, they were, some of them were young and healthy, biting on sad, supraglottic devices, um, but we saw that it happened also in, in older patients. We saw a sad case in a mid middle-aged lady who bit in a tracheal tube following surgery for a necrotic appendix, and she arrived, uh, she, she arrested from her hypoxia and, and in fact died. So uh, we, we saw a broad spectrum and also patients just having uh, soft tissue obstructions causing pulmonary edema. So there were, was, wasn't a particularly obvious um, patient that was, that was having this problem. Um, tracheal tubes, SADs and airways themselves, patients' airways were, were responsible. We saw severe hypoxia in these cases and several <coughs> reporters tried CPAP for a considerable amount of time and it didn't respond and all had to go to ITU for IPPV and 12 out of the 13 made a full recovery. So what do we do about these problems? As mentioned before, we saw a lot of obstruction by uh, patients biting on their own airway, and that was um, all sorts of airways. Um, and you don't have to use anything terribly sophisticated. I recognise it as a deficit in my current practice that I don't use bite blocks as often as I should. These are some ideas. I know people stick um, sometimes a roll-up gauze next to and stick it onto the Larry mask after insertion. I'm not sure if anyone does this here. G Goodell Airways um, and obviously the more advanced second, the second generation devices, the, the eye gels and the um, ProSeal have the integral bite block. And uh, the last patient is one of mine in the dental list. I realised actually I have bite blocks in my outpatient dental list. So there are lots of different ways of doing it. But it's very, very important to remember to, to use that. Um, so now the other less frequent causes, although we saw quite a lot of bleeding and it was always very, um, very poor, poorly, well, often very poorly treated and very serious, this requires careful inspection and suctioning before controlled extubation and I can't emphasise that enough. Laryngeal edema followed th op several operations and we saw three post-Trendelenburg positionings. And we saw neck hematoma cause problems producing airway edema and hampering reintubation <coughs> in previously uh, straightforward airways. And, and just to highlight the fact that removing the edema, moving the hematoma, removes the instruction, obstruction but not the edema. Um, we saw this after carotid surgery, after thyroid surgery, and uh, cervical spine surgery. <coughs> oh, and just before I go back, go on, I have to remind you that you should not leave. Um, packs in patients' airways because we had a, a rather sad case of that um, patient profoundly hypoxic um, and uh, distressed 
uh, in recovery and the second anaesthetist noticed that there was a pack left following the uh, lumbar spine surgery. Uh, talking about procedures that are involved with problems in recovery and surgical procedures, those who do ENT and max facts lists are what would be wise to learn that uh, 13 ENT procedures and 5 uh, oral max facts procedures feature in this, uh, in this group, so a large percentage. And surgery took place within the airway in 16 of these 38 cases. Four of this was by laser and one case had a stent. When we looked at the Trendelenburg cases, the three, we had a six-hour prostatectomy who was tubed, and when the tube was removed, uh, there was acute obstruction, which was then retrieved by a supraglottic device, and uh, an entry exchange catheter was used. And we saw it in the shorter gynae cases as well, and we used SADS, and that one of the gynae cases required a, a surgical tracheostomy on advice of an ENT surgeon. So looking to the future and planning ahead, and how can we change and improve um, our airway extubation plan and airway management plan are extremely important to remember and it's simple things that matter and I can't emphasise enough. In fact, I've started writing an airway, just a, a little airway plan next to my um, instructions to the recovery staff uh, on oxygenation and, and an analgesia and fluids. <coughs> so patients should all be assessed and optimised, including effective neuromuscular function, pre-oxygenation and appropriate airway toilet. The extubation take, should take place in the theatre with the team assembled and it may include specific techniques for reintubation. And when you go through to recovery, if you've used a McCoy laryngoscope and a bougie, take it through with you. If you've uh, used uh, entry exchange or a, a certain uh, type of airway, take it through to recovery and tell the staff. They should be aware of your ongoing management plan and you should be highlighting potential problems, the signs that you might see and the, the staff and equipment that you might require. And of course, some techniques require expertise, and this was a problem in some of our patients. Assistance was requested, but the anaesthetic department was short-staffed that day, and no senior help was available to assist. And I suspect that's happening up and down the country with, patient, with units that are, are being pushed to the limit. So it's very, very important we have people that are available to come and assist in these situations. We saw three um, fibre optics used in recovery, and we saw 10 emergency surgical airways. So we need the skills to be able to do that. Um, supplementary oxygen and monitoring is needed for transport after general anaesthesia. We saw two cases arrive in uh, recovery, hypoxic, and we have clear instructions from the association about what to do about transport and monitoring of these patients. And we also have a safety guideline from the association recently telling us about capnography. Um, we did see a very sad case of a, a, a four-year-old arrive in recovery without oxygen, hypoxic, had a cardiac arrest subsequent to a tonsillectomy and, and bleeding from, from that. So um, we can't overemphasise over over this either. And the patient sadly died later. Um, we're going on to recommendations now. Equipment, staff and training. All recovery staff should be trained and agreed to, a, uh, trained to an agreed standard. Uh, but they aren't, and we know we're working in units like delivery suite, like x-ray departments and endoscopy, this doesn't always happen. A case report uh, reported that uh, the trainee forgot to tell the recovery staff to use jaw thrust. Well, this actually shouldn't, you shouldn't have to tell recovery staff that. And actually, the association are about to publish some core competencies uh, and guidelines, which will be very welcome. <coughs> Senior staff should be available to help, as I said. Uh, a full range of equipment, area equipment, should be available in recovery. goes without saying, but doesn't happen. We were missing lots of bits of equipment in recovery that we, re we required bougies, nasopharyngeal airways, scopes, smaller tubes, and uh, capnography, capnography, capnography. It should be available in recovery, we know that. We, s we, we did see lots of cases where we, it should have been used earlier and we felt would have detected problems far earlier. <coughs> and finally, patients who have or had area problems uh, should be assessed before discharge from recovery. I've put down, just given you some, some quotations from the chapter, the trainee anaesthetist was slow to ask for help, the recovery staff did, and two consultants arrived within a few minutes. Propofol and succimethonium were given, but an appropriate sized tracheal tube was not available, and it took five minutes to obtain. The airway was established with an awake fibre optic and a small tube. <coughs> the patient was transferred, still intubated to recovery, and then extubated. Airway obstruction developed, junior trainee attended. The patient required urgent reintubation. And after a delay of at least five minutes, a consultant arrived. Now, does that sound familiar to anybody here? I, I hope not. 
But we have to ask ourselves, is there a way out of this? And uh, the, the chap here's got two paddles, so he's going to be all right. But obviously, we've got to look very carefully at what we're doing. This is the uh, NAP4 panel uh, looking at the 38 cases and the, the various factors that we talked about in the MPSA documents. And you'll see the three columns, the causal, contributory, and positive factors, because we did actually find quite a lot of positive things to say as well. Um, looking first at the causal, I uh, highlighted the patient being the causal factor, and there's not a lot we can do about that, I suppose. And the contributory, education and training, patient and judgment factor very highly here, and that's where we need to really focus our resources and our efforts. Um, and, but we have positive communication, good, good equipment and organisation in some of our hospitals, and uh, judgment was, was good in, in, in six cases, although it was three times, three times as bad. So lots of room for improvement. And I hope I've given you some idea of, of, of what we should be thinking about. And uh, thank you for your attention. And uh, I hope you give it your attention. Thank you.